Join me and together we will explore the African ways of life as revealed in their literature. I am Teacher Eugene and welcome to DepEd MP TV. I suggest that you keep in mind the following learning objectives which you have to attain as we go through exploring the richness of African literature. First, identify representative texts and authors from around the world, and for this particular lesson, texts and authors from Africa. Second, compare and contrast 21st century literary genres from across the globe as to their elements, structures, and literary traditions. And third, do an assessment of any creative adaptation of African literary pieces. Before we continue with this video, don't forget to accomplish the tasks in these sections of your module. Don't worry about having incorrect answers because the activities are provided just to warm you up anyway. You may have to pause this video to do the tasks. What is life in a continent with a history of oppressive colonialism, slavery, and racial bias? How much courage does it take to live with dark skin and dark coiled hair with this dark history? What does it mean to be an African? Let me take you to a journey of discovering the African ways of life as we quickly study the literary richness of this huge continent. Perhaps it's best to start with their literary history. There are three notable periods in the timeline of African literary history. First is the pre-colonial period which covers thousands of years ago in ancient Egypt to early 1800s before European countries colonized Africa. Second is the post-colonial period which gave birth to literary works that are considered a reaction to colonialism. And third, is the post-independence period which covers the time after African countries gained freedom from their respective European colonizers. The African pre-colonial literature is described as a reflection of the purest African life that is completely free from the influences of the white colonizers. Like any other place in the world, the literature of Africa began with their oral traditions, the prose and verse that were passed down from generation to generation through words of mouth. The oral tradition was the way of African tribes to educate their children about their culture, history, values, legends, and arts. These are undiluted African originals, which include myths and folktales, epics and proverbs, idioms and praise poems, dramas and songs, music and customs derived from African way. The oral literature or orature in this continent is rich and diverse thanks to the fact that Africa is made up of 54 nations, each nation having several tribes that speak different languages. In fact, Africa is home to about a thousand languages including Shona, Zolo, Swahili, Ndebele, Ikongo, Oromo, and many more. The African orator mirrors the people's way of living in their daily experiences, such as agriculture and livestock, witchcraft and superstition, nature and climate, hunting, social interaction, and so much more. African orator also carries out African moral values such as those in their trickster tales. 
The African poetry is mostly inseparable with their rituals and performing arts. Where there are rituals and occasions, there are songs and verses and stories told, and they are always accompanied by music and dances. You might notice some similarities of this with your own indigenous culture. And yes, there is that sort of marriage between our rituals and our oral literature. We'll probably talk about our own Igret literature in a separate video. Now, back to African orator. Original African songs were performed by ancient praise singers called griots, who were also the musicians, storytellers, and entertainers of pre-colonial Africa, quite similar to the minstrels or troubadours of medieval Europe. The praise songs performed by these griots were about love, work, children, and mythical heroes. Another interesting feature of African oral tradition is the call and response, an authentic technique in oral narratives which is performed with the leader giving the call and followed by the rest of the group giving the response. This would later influence contemporary music around the world and even political movements. Call and response is a very effective way to engage a crowd. The literature of Egypt is often studied separately from the context of African literature. But since Egypt is part of Africa, we will include a little bit of Egyptian literature here. The accounts from the Egyptian hieroglyphics are actually among the earliest written literature in the world. With the Egyptian hieroglyphics and hieratics, we know some stories about pharaohs and Egyptian gods and deities. These ancient writings also have many prayers, poems, songs, and proverbs, and even personal essays. In summary, here are some distinctive features of African pre-colonial literature that I picked out for you. African pre-colonial literature is originally African, no influence from colonizers. African orature is intertwined with indigenous rituals, dances, and music. The call and response narratives are original to African orature. Griots played a great role in the passing of oral tradition in Africa. Egyptian hieroglyphic and hieratic writings are the earliest written literature of pre-colonial Africa. The African post-colonial literature reveals a reaction against colonialism and a passionate appreciation of all that is originally African. African nature, African beauty, and African courage. Please note that the post-colonial African literature does not necessarily mean after the colonial times. It may also include writings that were made during the colonial period from 1880 to 1960. For conventional purposes, we use the term post-colonial to signify that the literary works are a response of the African people or sort of a protest against colonialism that has brought atrocities to their land and people. The Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885, aka the Scramble for Africa, formalized the territorial claims of European countries in the African continent. Great Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, and Belgium had their shares on the partitioning of African lands. But so sad to say, the Berlin Conference had no plans or whatsoever about the African people from whom the lands are divided. 
Eventually, the African people suffered from severe brutality, slavery, and displacement during the colonization period. And the slave trade has brought millions of African people to Europe and America as slaves. Hence, the term African diaspora. During these dark times of history, the African traditions, including their oral literature, were seen by colonizers as savage, backwards, uncivilized, or demonic. Oral tradition did not flourish while the colonizers brought European language and literacy, Christianity, and education, alongside exploiting their lands and resources, and even their people as well. As historians put it, the European colonization is for gold, God, and glory. Yes, gold comes first. African postcolonial literature therefore reveals the hardships faced by the African people and tries to rediscover the ancient African values that had been erased by European cultural superiority. In the 1930s, the Negritude movement was born. It was a literary revolution initiated by African intellectuals from French colonies. The Negritude movement paved ways to writings that dealt with reactions against colonial repression and against the white man's perceptions of Africa and its people. Popular in this period were the slave narratives which described vividly the horrors of slavery and slave trade. Also, Negritude used European languages to create poems that showcase the greatness of African values, African people, and African culture and tradition. Examples of this are Leopold Sedar Senior's poetry collections in French language. Here are some African literary creations during the colonial period. Ethiopia Unbound, Studies in Race Emancipation was written in 1911. It was the first African novel written in English by Joseph Ephraim Casely Hayford. Shaka was a historical novel authored by Thomas Mofolo in 1925. The Girl Who Killed to Save, Noam Kawusi, The Liberator, was a play based on a true story written by Herbert Isaac Ernest Delomo in 1935. The anthology of the New Negro and Malagasy Poetry in the French Language was authored by Leopold Sedar Senior in 1948. The poems in this anthology revered and celebrated everything that the Europeans despised about Africa. The color of their skin, their hair, and their ways of living, which were called barbaric by the whites. Towards the middle of the 20th century, more and more Africans were educated and they started to realize this colonial deceptiveness. And so, themes of writing spoke about deliverance, freedom or independence, and of course, racism. The novel of Nigerian author Chinua Achebe, called Things Fall Apart, was published in 1958. The novel has achieved worldwide influence, and it is one of the greatest and most influential African novels of all time. It is also important to acknowledge that there were white people who understood the blacks and sympathized with them against inhumane acts. Authors like Nadine Gordimer of South Africa and Nobel Prize winner Doris Lissing from Zimbabwe wrote about racial lack of fairness, which actually got them deported out of their countries. In 1962, Kenyan author Ngugi Wa Thiongo released the first East African drama ever written in English, called The Black Hermit. This play portrayed a beautiful contrast of the simplicity of tribal life and the complexity of civilized life in the middle of a politically unstable nation. Like Africa, our country also has a history of being colonized by foreign nations, and reactions to this are also revealed in our literature. Take for example the short story The God Stealer by national artist Francisco Sainal Jose, 
which you have studied earlier in this subject. It reflects our retaliation against the bad sides of colonialism, right? There are two distinct phases of African post-colonial literature. One reflects the colonial repressions and how Africans have dealt with slavery, humiliation, and violation of human rights. The other phase reflects the beauty, essence, and splendor of Africa which the colonizers quite misunderstood or shall we say ignored. How important are these post-colonial writings? Well, they encouraged the black pride and this led the African people to take up space and fight for their independence. And their freedom from colonizers gave birth to a new era, the post-independence period. The post-independence African literature showcases the desires of a movement called Pan-Africanism. This movement is a worldwide drive that calls for solidarity among people around the world who have African ancestry. In the name of progress, pride, and common history, moving forward despite the horrors of the colonial past and reclaiming that beautiful African identity that took a backseat in almost a century. Political issues rose in many African countries during the post-independence period. New governments were involved in big-scale corruption and bribery, militarism and treason, and they appeared to be as oppressive as their colonial white rulers who came before them. This eventually became subjects of writings for post-independence authors. Yes, even up to these days, some countries in Africa are still suffering from unstable political systems, which of course lead to protests, coup d'etats, and violence. The Wretched of the Earth, written by Franz Fanon in 1961, is an example of literature that tackles political issues of the post-independence Africa. Meanwhile, legendary author Chinua Achebe went on to write and publish famous novels like A Man of the People, Ant Hills of Savannah, Arrow of God, and many more. Another notable author of the post-independence period was 1986 Nobel Prize winner Nigerian playwright Wole Soyinka, who has since then published many works including The Lion and the Jewel, Death and the King's Horseman, The Strong Breed, A Shuttle in the Crypt, and much, much more. Other Pan-African literary works speak about gender issues. You know, there was a sort of a perspective shift from the oppression of the black man and his struggles for liberation to the oppression of the black woman and her struggles for equality. Yes, African societies also have that male superiority stigma like societies in other continents. Examples of feministic African literature are Nigerian writer Buchi Emejita's novels, Joys of Motherhood, published in 1979, and Second Class Citizen, published in 1974. Other literary works that challenge gender bias and racial imbalance are Purple Violet of Oshantu, written by Namibian author Nishani Andreas, Nervous Conditions, written by Zimbabwe's Tsitsi Dangaremga. Purple Hibiscus, written by Nigerian Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And Scarlet Song, written by Senegali Mariyama Ba. With these three periods of literary history, African literature has become a distinctive treasure with the many world-class authors like Wole Soyinka, Buchi Imechita, Chinua Achebe, Nishani Andreas, and many more who have successfully used the power of writing to show the world what it means to be an African. I grew up in a world where a woman who looks like me, with my kind of skin and my kind of hair, was never considered to be beautiful. And I think that it is time that that stops today. Our quick exploration of African literature concludes here. In the next video, we will have a study of the literature of Europe. 
I hope that this video was able to help you with your home learning. You will have to continue doing the learning tasks in your module. Remember to always follow the instructions. This has been your teacher Eugene saying thank you for watching DepEd MPTV. Good day.